Hey gang, welcome back. What we're going to do in this lesson is we're going to talk about the nuances and some of the important things that we need to understand when we have layer two environments that are going to be redundant in nature. So the moment we start having redundant switch topologies, we're going to realize that we have a situation here that we need to be able to address almost immediately. So when we look at our configuration, what we're going to see is, is that I'm going to have things like cat one, cat two, connected to cat three. Now, until I close my loop, I have absolutely no problems. So in this scenario, there's no way that traffic can go from here to here back to here. In no shape, fashion, or form could that possibly happen. However, the moment that I close this infrastructure, I now have the capacity, at the very least, to be able to create a looping scenario. Remember, we're talking about switches. And remember, switches uses, use frames for the purposes of communicating information at layer two, and frames have no TTL. So time to live does not exist in the context of a frame. So it is entirely possible that we can accidentally create looped scenarios where we're going to send frames, where they're going to constantly be replicated and flooded ad infinitum. And this can actually cause us a problem that used to happen back in the early days of networking that was called a broadcast storm and what it can quite literally bring your network to its knees. Now nowadays it's not necessarily that big of a deal, but one of the things that we have to understand is, is that what we're doing is we're collecting or connecting multiple networks via these connections and this loop that we can accidentally create could be absolutely catastrophic to our infrastructure. So what we want to do here is, is that we want to have these multiple loops because imagine what would happen if somebody just came along and accidentally cut this link. If I did not have my loop, that means one part of my network would, be, would actually be black hole. Now, by virtue of having the loop, what happens is I'm just going to take the alternate way to go through my infrastructure. So this makes sense. But like I said, it introduced a problem, and that probability, that issue was is the idea that we had MAC address population problems, we had the idea of broadcast storms and other things that just quite literally brought our infrastructure down to its knees. So what ended up happening is we needed a fix for this. The fix we needed was some type of loop prevention mechanism. Now that loop prevention mechanism came to us in the flavor of a way to stop this process. And it came to us in what's referred to as spanning tree protocol. So spanning tree protocol is the answer to this scenario where we can accidentally induce a loop. Now when we look at this, what's going to end up happening here is the spanning tree is going to give us a loop-free topology. And what we're going to have to realize is this is an industry standards process that was actually mandated by IEEE and it was designated 802.1D. 802.1D defines something called CST, that stands for Common Instance Spanning Tree. Now, common instance spanning tree is really important to us, especially in the industry, because we want to have these redundant interfaces and these redundant connections in our infrastructure, but we have to have some way of being able to avoid this idea of this catastrophic process of a loop. And spanning tree is the default process. Now, what we need to understand here is, is that as this evolves, we find ourselves in a situation where if we want to employ or deploy spanning tree, what we're going to do is we have to recognize that there's basic operations that we need to embrace. So what are their spanning tree, STP, spanning tree protocol, what is its operation? How does it work? And what are any significant roles that are part and parcel of its process? Well, first of all, we need to understand spanning tree employs an algorithm. That algorithm allows me to create a loop-free graph. So in a way, it's kind of similar to what we have in the context of OSPF. And what it's going to do is it's going to go through a series of processes where it's going to elect different aspects of its configuration for specific behaviors. The first thing that's going to do is it's going to elect a root bridge. Now the root bridge election is going to be very important because the root is going to be the center or the root of this graph that we're going to be creating. 
Second to that, what we're going to do is we're going to have another election where we're going to elect root ports. Then once that's done, we're going to have another election. We're going to elect designated ports for each segment. And then after that, what we're going to end up doing is, is we're, going to pro we're going to actually transition to what's referred to as a forwarding state where we can actually send information or we may find ourselves going to a blocking state. Now, here's the scenario. Let's take a look at this from just a graphical point of view. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull myself over here so I can keep writing and drawing. But I'm going to first of all pick a narrower pin configuration. So let's say we have that scenario where we have cat1 connected to cat2 connected to cat3. These are all catalyst switches and we have them configured to where we have this loop interconnection. Well what we're going to do is we're going to elect first of all this idea of a root bridge. And the way we're going to do that is on the basis of something called the BID, the bridge ID. Now we're going to communicate information from each of these individual devices and what we're going to do is this bid is going to be communicated inside of a packet or a frame, excuse me, called a BPDU. That stands for a Bridge Protocol Data Unit. Now what we're going to find out is, is traditionally in 802.1D the bid is going to be broken up into two categories. First of all, the MAC address of the router or the switch, excuse me, the switch. So the MAC address. Then after that we're going to have something called the bridge priority. Now what we have to recognize here is, is that if we leave everything the way it is, we're going to have a default bridge priority of 32768 for every switch in our infrastructure. Now what's going to happen is, is that means the tiebreaker to determine who's going to win this election is going to be the MAC address. The oldest i.e. the numerically lowest MAC address is going to be the one that's going to be picked as the root bridge in our infrastructure. Now the root bridge is going to be in charge of everything from that point. Now what's going to end up happening here is, is that we're going to then, now that we have our root bridge, we're going to move to the second part of the selection. So let's say in this topology R1 is the root bridge. Now the root bridge is easy to designate because on the root bridge every interface is going to be in a designated mode. So what does designated mean? What is a designated port? Well a designated port is a port that leads away from a root bridge. So if every, if the root bridge has ports on it, every port has to lead away so all of those ports are going to be in designated mode. Now the next part of this is, is we need to elect root ports. Well a root port is a port leading towards a root bridge and they're going to be elected on the remaining devices. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the least cost path to be able to reach the root bridge. So in this instance these would be root ports depending on the fact that we have all the same costs in these values. So let's just say 19. Now what we're going to find here is, is that means cat1 is going to use this link, cat3 is going to use this link to reach cat1. Now what we're going to end up having to do here is we're going to designate this idea of our designated port for each segment. Now the designated port again is going to lead away from the switch. So when we look at this, the only ports that we have that are going to be here are going to be designated ports are going to be the ports that are pointing towards each other. Now what we're going to do is, is that we're going to actually make a decision here because what we're going to do is this link is not going to be forwarding in normal operation. And this is going to allow us to prevent that formation of the loop. So what's going to happen is we're going to block spanning tree and block forwarding on this particular port. What we're going to do is, is again the one that gets blocked is going to be the one that has the highest MAC address if we leave everything alone. If I go in and adjust my priority, lower is better. But it's going to have to be adjusted in increments of 4096. So it's going to be 0, 4096, 4096 times 2, times 3, times 4, that type of thing. So when we look at this, this is going to be one of the pivotal components for being able to ensure that our infrastructure is going to work exactly the way that we want it to be able to operate. Now that means, like I said, we're going to have to recognize the fact that the industry standards body created 
the 802.1D standard, and that stands for the common spanning tree. So let's look at that, because what we're going to find here is, is for a little while we had kind of a war between Cisco and the standards body. So let's look at spanning tree protocol standards, STP standards. Of the standards, we have the very, very first industry specification, which was 802.1D. But I told you guys that that was common spanning tree, which means it only supports one instance of spanning tree. Why? Because remember, VLANs are a Cisco construct. The industry standards body says, well, we're not going to waste time with this idea of VLANs. So what we're going to do is we're just going to support one switch fabric and Cisco can just go pee up a rope because it's not really important to us and we don't see how it's going to be significant. Now, what Cisco did is they took the idea of 802.1D and they created their own proprietary protocol, which is referred to as PVST+. Now, per VLAN spanning tree plus, like I said, is Cisco proprietary. And what it does is it modifies the 802.1D behavior so that now I support the idea of an instance of spanning tree. So I have a spanning tree protocol for every VLAN up to 1 to 496 VLANs. Now, you know, that's been definitely something that the industry standards body was looking at. And the other thing that we also have to realize is that 802.1D was very, very slow. For instance, we have something called a forwarding delay. The forwarding delay determines how long I'm going to be listening and learning before I actually forward traffic. So this is all part of my control plane convergence mechanisms that's operating in the context of my spanning tree protocol. Now, what will happen here is, is that this is going to be 15 seconds by default for each of these. So 30 seconds could pass in a fully functional environment before I can be sending information on a link. And it takes some computers less than half that amount of time to actually boot up. So what will end up happening is the computer could come up so much faster than the spanning tree ports can become operational and start forwarding data that the system failures to authenticate to like a server or things along those lines. So that became a problem. So what Cisco did is Cisco came up with some augmentations to add to per VLAN spanning tree. Of them, some of the more interesting ones were port fast. Port fast allows me to bypass this 15 seconds listening and learning and begin forwarding immediately. So that alleviated a lot of problems. We also had a situation called backbone fast where I could determine if there's a problem down the road towards the root bridge that I'm going to know exactly how I'm going to behave when that problem takes place. So I have alternate paths in my infrastructure. Another solution would be uplink fast. So a backbone means it's an indirect connection along the path going back to the root bridge and uplink fast means it's going to be an actual physically attached link that it goes down. I'm going to automatically have a backup so I'm not going to have to go through convergence. So in other words, I don't have to wait for these processes. The faster I can converge, the faster I form traffic or I can forward traffic. The thing that we need to understand here is, is that while we're converging, we're not sending any information in our infrastructure whatsoever. So we want to mitigate that process. Well, the standards body looked at these augmentations and said, you know, these are pretty cool because it speeds up our performance. And what they did is they created another protocol, 802.1W. Now, 802.1W is defined as rapid spanning tree protocol. Now, rapid spanning tree protocol is represented by the standard 802.1W. And the way I always remember it is I think of Elmer Fudd saying WAPID. All right, so 802.1W, W standing for WAPID spanning tree, is going to be how we're going to let the, the industry standards body is going to say, well, we like these augmentations that you implemented, so we're going to steal those but we're still not going to support VLANs. So no VLANs, still only one VLAN. So 802.1W by its veritable standard is still a common spanning tree configuration. Not any real difference with regard to 802.1D, except the name implies that it operates faster, it converges faster, it detects issues faster. It's going to handle the sending of information in different ways. In other words, we're going to get these optimizations in place. 
Now, Cisco said, you know, that's really cool. We like that, but we still like our VLAN idea. So what Cisco did is they took this and they adapted it again by coming out with a protocol that was compatible with it, but still supported VLANs. And that was the concept of rapid PVST. So rapid per VLAN spanning tree protocol. Now, rapid per VLAN spanning tree protocol took a lot of those integrations and all of those features that they originally had, plus the enhancements that were added by the standards body. And it wasn't until the, the, system, the industry standards body created 802.1S Sierra, which is referred to as MST, multi-instance spanning tree, that they came up and they said, well, you know what, Cisco may be onto something here. These VLANs are really helpful when we have IP telephony networks, when we have the interconnection between video and things like that. So these VLANs have an actual application. We probably should have accepted it sooner. However, to support one to 4,096 of them is just simply insane. So what ends up happening is, is the standards body modified or came up with 802.1S, which took everything in 802.1W for rapid and incorporated it and they supported their idea of VLANs, but instead of the VLANs, they call it instances. So an instance is going to be basically just a VLAN mapping to a particular instance. We always have instance zero by default and we can create other instances to be able to support traffic. Now when we go in and we start looking at this, again, we can start graphing this out a little bit. So when we go through and we look at exactly the specifications, what it really boils down to is this. Of the protocols that we have, we have spanning tree protocol, we have per VLAN spanning tree protocol plus PVSTP or PVST, we have rapid spanning tree protocol, and then we have the rapid PVST plus. Now of these, this one is a Cisco proprietary standard, this is a Cisco proprietary standard, and what we're going to find here is this spanning tree, 802.1w, supports one tree. RSTP supports one tree. Rapid PVST and PVST support multiple trees or many trees. That means I'm going to have a tree or a graph for every VLAN. That's what per VLAN stands for in this particular analogy. Now the idea is, is that these converge slow. These converge fast. And that's the primary payoff and difference. Now what we also need to understand is, is things like rapid PVST have high CP utilization requirements. So it can actually burn up quite a bit of processing capability inside of our system. Now when we look at what's happening on our console, let's go back to our routers, I'm sorry, to our switches, and let's look at the exact configuration with regard to what we're running by default. I've done no configuration, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show, do the show spanning tree command, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look and see exactly what it is I'm running. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually increase the size of this so that we can see at least one whole cycle. Notice it says spanning tree enabled is IEEE standard. Now that means I'm actually running PVST plus. So when I look at this, I have the option of specifying what spanning tree I want to use. I can say spanning tree mode and I can specify PVST, rapid PVST or MST. So again, these are going to be the industry standards adoption that Cisco made for common spanning tree, they modified it to support multiple VLANs. This is going to be Cisco's implementation of 802.1W. And lastly, we see there the idea of MST, multi-instance spanning tree. Now, what we need to understand here is, is that this gives us some unique capabilities. Because we have an instance of spanning tree protocol for each VLAN, that means for every VLAN, we can elect a different root bridge. So if I have four switches, so let's say we have SW1 connected to SW2, SW3, and SW4 connected in a loop, what I could do is I could make SW1 
the root bridge for VLANs 100 to 110. I could make SW2 the root bridge for VLANs 111 to 120. I could come over here and make SW3 the root bridge for VLANs 121 to 130. I could additionally come in here and make modifications such that SW4 could be the root bridge for 131 to 140. So what we see here is, is now I have the capability of being able to distribute the load of my spanning tree environment across multiple switches. Now what we also are going to realize is that we have different types of redundancy. So in this scenario that I have right here above my head, I have a loop. But it's also possible for me to have interconnections where I have multiple links connecting two switches. And just like spanning tree is going to use the idea of blocking to kill an individual link so that it can't induce a loop in our infrastructure, we also have to recognize that the fact exists that in this scenario, we could actually send traffic into SW2 and it could actually hairpin and come back to us via the second link. So what we're going to find is the spanning tree is also going to break down or to block interfaces that are going to be redundant. So if I had in here, I had three interfaces, two of those interfaces are not going to be forwarding traffic, only one of them would. So we lose bandwidth in order to be able to prevent this possibility of having a formation of an actual loop in our infrastructure. Now what I want to do is I want to entertain something and I'm going to do it at the console rather than doing it on the whiteboard. So when we look at this, like I said, we have two devices right now that are interconnected. We have CAT1 and we have CAT2. So let's look at this. Show spanning tree for VLAN1. And what I'm going to see here is, is that I'm running, like I said, 802.1D equivalent, which is going to be PVST plus on Cisco. Cisco switches do not support 802.1D. That's the industry standard. That's the difference between common spanning tree and per VLAN spanning tree. Now when we take a look at this, notice that we have a priority value. Now I told you my priority to value is going to be 32768 by default. But Terry, this is going to be, this one actually says it's 32769. Well, what we have is we've got a modification of the behavior with PVST. So remember, I said specifically we had the priority value and we had the MAC address. This is what was defined in 802.1D. Well, which Cisco did not implement. Cisco instead implements per VLAN spanning tree. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually take a portion of our priority value and we're going to define something called an extended system ID. It's a fancy term for our VLAN. So notice, I looked at VLAN 1. That means I'm looking for the, pre, the priority of 32768 plus 1. So in this instance, what we see is, is that the actual calculated value is 32769. This prevents me from having to have tons of MAC addresses on my switch in order to have a way of creating a bid, a bridge ID, that's going to specify or allow me to be able to support multiple VLANs. Now, what also I want to point out here is, as we can see, the bridge priority here is 32769. Notice it has my priority of 32768 plus my extended system ID. Now we have more extended, more values here. So what I'll do is, let's see, I should have VLAN 10 here, if I remember correctly. So let's take a look at VLAN 10. No, nope, uh, VLAN 20. Yeah, there we go. So when we start looking at VLAN 20, here's what we see. Again, I have my priority, which is 32788 this time, which is going to be 32768 plus 20, adding up to 32788. So that's my adjusted priority. Now the other thing that I wanted to point out here is, is that we have this root bridge election. Notice it's telling me this bridge is the root. So if we operate under the assumption that we have not changed our priority, 
Our priority is going to be 32768 on both of the devices, CAT1 and CAT2. Now, what we need to look at now is, is going to be the MAC address. So, what we have here on CAT1 is we have a MAC address of 001B.D4BD6B00. This is the MAC address. This is the system MAC address. Now what I want to do is I'm going to just simply leave this on the whiteboard and I'm going to cut over to CAT2 and I want to see what's happening over here in that same VLAN. Show spanning tree VLAN 20. Now my problem is, is VLAN 20 doesn't exist here. So show VLAN brief. Let's see what we've got going on here and what we're going to see is, is VLAN 20 does not exist here. We only have VLAN 123 and VLAN 236. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create that VLAN. I'm going to say VLAN 20 exit, exit, show, VLAN brief. And let's see if it actually exists now. And it does. So let's see if it's actually forwarding now. Do show, um, do show spanning tree for VLAN 20. And it is, but look here. Notice I have values of learning. We're going to listen for 15 seconds, then we're going to learn for 15 seconds before we can even forward traffic. But the moment that we're finished, we're going to begin forwarding the information. Now in this situation, what we're going to see here is, is that now that we're up and operational, please note that this bridge is now the route for VLAN 20. Let's cut back over to R1 and look at it. Before it said it was the root bridge for the VLAN. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to repeat that process and now what we're going to see is it's no longer designating itself as the root bridge. So when we look at this, we look at the MAC address for the other device. So the root bridge or the bridge ID, so the, the root ID is going to be ending, it's going to be 0019. Now I don't even have to go any further to know that 0019 is numerically less than 0016. So or, that's actually 001B. So when we go over here, the 9 is going to be less than the B. So what it basically distills down to here is, is that this switch, CAT2, is being elected the root. Now the moment that it's the elected the root, what's going to end up happening is all of its ports to CAT1 are going to be placed into the forwarding designated state. Now we can view that. Let's cut over here over to CAT2. Notice, like I said, forwarding designated, both FAO 23 and FAO 24. Now what we're going to have to understand here is, is that again, we've got that hazard that we want to avoid. We do not want traffic to come in and get hairpinned and get sent back. So when we take a look at what's happening on CAT1, we're going to find out that one of these ports are actually being blocked. Port 24 is being blocked, and what we're doing is we're electing port 23 as our root port. So it's going to look something like this. We're going to be blocking on this interface, and we're going to be forwarding on this interface. So this is going to be slash 23, this one is going to be slash 24. Now, all things left equal, i.e. we're not affecting any type of priorities or any values here on this particular part of our election, what's going to end up happening is the lowest port number is going to be picked for forwarding, the highest port numbers are going to be blocking. So again, we step in and we've looked at that process. We've talked about how the bridge ID was broken up. We've used the show commands. And we now need to look at what's going to be involved if I want to manipulate this process. So right now we know that CAT2 is the root bridge. I want to alter that behavior. And I'm going to alter that behavior using two methods. The first method I'm going to highlight is going to be how we can go in here and actually, just actually change the priority in order to be able to rig this election. So I'm going to say config T. I'm going to say spanning tree VLAN 20. And I'm going to specify a priority. And what I'm going to say is I'll have the capability of entering 0 to 61,440. However, I'm going to say 15. I'm going to hit enter. Now what it's going to do is it's going to tell me I have to do it in increments of 4,096. And it's going to go so far as to give me the values. Lower is better. Remember, 32,768 is the default. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick 
8192. So I'm simply going to come up here and say priority 8192. I'm going to hit enter. And what we're going to find here is, is that I'm going to now be the root bridge for this VLAN. Do show spanning tree for VLAN 20. And notice right here, we're listening on this interface. We're learning now, so 15 seconds listening, 15 seconds learning, and then ultimately we will move from learning to forwarding. But again, it'll be 15 seconds before we do it. So 30 seconds total with regard to how long we have to wait in order to be able to forward information. Now notice, both interfaces on this device are forwarding and designated. That's because this is now the root bridge. And it's now the root bridge based on the fact that I manipulated my priority. Now another way that I could do this would be to go over to Cat2 and say I want Cat2 to be in charge of running this VLAN now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say spanning tree for VLAN 20. And rather than saying priority, what I'm going to say is, is I'm going to say root. I'm going to specify primary. Now the moment that I specify root primary, what I'm doing is I'm actually doing a run time, one time running macro. Now this means that it's going to, at the time I enter the enter command, it's going to look at all of the BPDUs and the bids that it has. And what it's going to do is it's going to make a manipulation to its local priority such that it's going to become the root bridge. But it's going to make the minimum change. So when I go through here, and I want to do now is I want to do do show spanning tree for VLAN 20. Actually, I changed it for VLAN 10 by accident. Uh, let me go ahead and just make it 20. Do show spanning tree VLAN 20. Notice right now, we've just elected ourselves as the root bridge. This bridge is the root. We're going through the listening, then we'll move to the learning. Again, 15 seconds and 15 seconds. Learning, 15 seconds and learning, then ultimately we'll actually move to forwarding. But what I want to point out here is, is notice exactly what was changed. Notice the system matched my, Mac, my priority. It didn't go lower, it matched it. Why? Because the system knew that this device has a lower MAC address already. It's got the, the 00.19. So bear in mind, the commands that we just explained and walked through simply make manipulations and changes in order to make certain that the device becomes the, MAC, becomes the actual root bridge in our topology. And what we're going to do is that's going to give us the capability of being able to support this idea of convergence and it's also going to be part and parcel of this entire process of electing the root bridge. Now I mentioned the fact that we have some other enhancements. Some of those enhancements are pretty interesting. One of them is going to be the idea of being able to configure port fast. So what we'll do is let's go to cat1 and on cat1 what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to that interface FAO1 that I configured before. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say spanning tree port fast. And what I'm going to find here is, is I'm going to be able to enter this command and what's going to happen is, is that the moment I type this command in, the system is going to say, well I'm going to ignore that listening and learning thing. So let's go in here and say do show run interface FAO1. Alright, let's put this in an access, into an access VLAN. So we'll say switch port mode access, switch port access VLAN 20. Do show spanning tree for VLAN 20. Now notice what we have here. One is designated and forwarding already. I know that it's in spanning tree port fast mode because it says edge on it. Now that implies the fact that I'm no longer going to be dealing with this idea of listening and learning. Notice it came up almost automatically. Now the issue here is, is that we have a problem. The problem is, is that this is coming up and it's telling me it's an edge port. Let's take a look at the commands that we can employ here. Because what I want to do is I want to show you what the actual behavior is. If I have a port configured in port fast mode, it's operating under the assumption that it's not connected to a switch. Now if I should be connected to a switch in some shape, fashion, or form, what's going to end up happening is the system is going to take itself out of port fast mode. So when we start looking at this, let's see what we have here. So I'm going to say exit. I'm going to say 
show interface FAO1 port fast. No, it's not port fast. Uh, switch port. No, bear with me. Show spanning tree. Interface FAO1 port fast. So notice it tells me that port fast is enabled on this interface for VLAN 20. Now what I want to do is I want to alter this behavior. So first of all, I want to find out what device I'm connected to out this interface. So show CDP neighbors and let's see what I have going out fast Ethernet 01, if anything. So let's see, fast, it's gigabit, it's cat one. Fast Ethernet 1's got me connected to R1 at gigabit Ethernet 00. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to R1. Actually, I can't go to R1. Um, yes, I can. I'll just have to open it up and have a second R1 here. So connect. Let's see what I've got going on here. I want to go to R1. Make sure I'm on the right device. Yep, pod 102. Let's go into R1. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to access the interface. Let me go ahead and fix this since it decided to mess itself up. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to R1 and I'm going to make a configuration change. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say, first of all, I want to make this behave like a switch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say bridge. And what I'm going to specify here is bridge one. And I'm going to say protocol. No, I'm going to say, pro, um, what is it? Yeah, protocol. Bridge protocol, and what I want to do is specify IEEE in order to be able to support spanning tree. Now if I come up here and say, do show spanning tree, what I'm going to find is, is this switch is now acting like a router. I'm sorry, this router is now acting like a switch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to interface FA01, and I'm going to place this in that bridge group. So interface G00, excuse me. G O O. Gigabit zero zero. Now, by executing this command, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say bridge group one. And I'm just going to hit enter. We got a lot of options, but I want to hit enter. Now, what this means is I should start sending BPDUs. Do show spanning tree. And as I can see on port three here, notice I'm in listening. So I'm going to have to go through this entire process here and see what's happening. Now I'm learning on gigabit zero zero and let's see if I actually send any BPDUs at all. Still learning. Learning. Now I'm forwarding. Still haven't sent any BPDUs. So in order to force this process, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to shut this interface down. All right. Now by shutting the interface down, I'm going to force it to reset, which means it's going to have to reconverge. So then I'll do a no shut and we'll wait for the interface to come back up and let's see if it sends any BPDUs now. So do show spanning tree. And what we're going to find here is that we should send at least one BPDU. There it is. We sent one BPDU, one bridge protocol data unit. Now what that means is that bridge protocol data unit arrived on cat1 fast ethernet 00. Now what I want to do is I'm just going to do the command that I had before, show spanning tree interface fast ethernet 01 for the port fast. And what I want to point out here is, is it's now disabled. The moment it received a BPDU, it disabled the configuration. Now, <clears throat> port, it just basically said I'm going to take myself out of port fast. Now if I do show run interface FA01, I'm still going to have the command here, port fast, but it's not operationally doing what it's supposed to. Why? Because it received that BPDU. So before I forget, I'm going to cut it back over to R1 and remove that configuration. I'm going to take it out of the bridge group. I'm going to say no bridge group. I'll go ahead and remove the configuration where I created the actual bridge group itself. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to shut the interface down and shut it back and bring it back up. So shut, no shut. And let's see what happens. No shut. 
So now if I cut back over to cat1, what am I going to see when I execute the command that said to show spanning tree port fast? Notice it's now been re-enabled. Why? Because we're not receiving any of the connections here. Now the problem is, is that this could be problematic. I may not want to ever be able to process BPDUs on this port. So one of the options that I could do is I could go into the interface and say config t interface FAO1 and what I can say is I can say spanning tree port fast and I can execute the command of let's see no I want to say spanning tree BPDU guard enable do show run interface FA0 now what we did here is, is remember when we just had port fast, when we received the BPDU, we took the port out of port fast mode. Now what I've done now is I've said, well, I want to do more than that. I want to actually disable this port the moment I receive this. So I'm going to come in here and say, do show interface status. And what we're going to see on port 01, we have this idea here of VLAN 20 being up and operational and it tells me that I'm connected. So let's go back over to R1 and repeat that command. I probably shouldn't have removed it. I was just not wanting to leave configuration in place. So here we'll go ahead and say bridge one protocol IEEE interface G00 bridge group one and that's it shut no shut actually I didn't wait long enough so it will shut change it down see if it comes back up and what I want to do is I'm going to cut back over to cat1 while it's coming up and notice what it says here it says BPDU guard error detected what it did is it put the port in error disable state so let's take a look at our command here show do show interface status. Notice now it's telling me that port FAO1 is now down. It's error disabled. It's been turned off. Now what I can do here is I can, I can look at this and say, well, in order to fix this, I need to go to interface FAO1 and I need to manually shut it down. And then I need to manually no shut it. Bring it back up. Now the problem is, is the moment it comes back up, the system is going to try to reconverge and a BPDU is going to be sent from R1. It's going to arrive on Fast Ethernet 1, on CAT1, and the system is going to again put itself down into error disable mode. Now once it's gone into error disable mode, again, if I want to be able to fix this issue, I need to be able to do it myself. I need to go under the interface and I need to be able to correct the actual problem. So do show interface status and let's see what we have here so this, we're still connected so we should receive a BPDU at some point now what I'm trying to illustrate here is, is the fact that we also have another option I can do this manually every time it happens or I also have the capability of using something called error disable recovery I can come into my system and say error disable recovery cause and specify the cause one of my many many causes is going to be BPDU guard then what I end up doing is just press enter now I need to give it a waiting period I need to say error disable recovery interval and I want to wait X number of seconds 30 seconds before I try to implement a repair so all this does is it's going to wait a certain amount of time and it's going to bring the interface and reset it and bring it back up. But the moment a BPDU arrives, it's obviously going to bring itself back down again. So this is not necessarily something that's going to be a cure-all, but it can definitely help us in the confines of ensuring that our system is going to remain up and operational and it doesn't inconvenience us because every time a user does something we tell them to, not to do, say introducing a system into our switching environment where BPDs are going to be sent, what we can do is we can protect ourselves from that entire process. So, I mean, we've done a majority of this on the console. We did the, quite a bit of whiteboarding. And with that being wrapping up this lesson, I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.